so many of you know who I am. Um, you might know me as Sister Carey, um, my honoured wife of Elder Carey. Uh, the same Elder Carey actually who's spoken to you from this very spot in the past. Um, some of you may know me as the proud mother of O'Shea, Sienna and Aya. The same children that were stood here last week, blessing you at the 13th Sabbath with their songs and reciting their memory verses. Um, some of you might know me as the lady who served your soup before or helped you with lunch. Um, or the Sabbath school teacher for the PowerPoint class. You know, these are all um, proverbial hats that I've worn in church. But if I was to tell you about some of the roles that I have at one time or another played in my life outside of church, I'm not sure that you'd really be that happy for me to be here breaking the bread of life with you today. You know, could you associate the words thief, liar, adulteress, drunkard with the sister Carrie that you know? But you know, God is amazing, truly amazing. To him be the glory. Amen. Great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, yielded his life and atonement for my sin, for your sin, and opened the life gate so that just Brother Scarlet could go in? No. So that we can all go in. Please let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for blessing us today with this Sabbath day. Thank you for allowing us to come together and fellowship and convene under this roof in your home, in your presence. Father, I pray that you will bless your waiting congregation. Feed them, nourish them. They have been <coughs> weak, empty and alone without you. And here they've come to dwell in your presence. Father, bless them in this message. Allow my words to be used to your will. Bend their spirit and their mind to really be touched by your message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So my message today is called Testify of Me. I'm not going to bore you with um, my own personal testimony. I'll touch upon elements of it. But, you know, I'd never really call myself a preacher. But God has seen fit to you. <laughs> but God has seen fit to um, use me to share a message with my brethren before in the past. And he always makes a way for the word that I share to be received. So, you know, please pray for me while I'm stood up here. Um, as I speak to you this afternoon, this year, actually, will mark the 8th anniversary of my marriage to my husband, Yay. and um, also my commitment to Christ. For the last eight years of my walk with God, I have wanted to confess, with all who may want to listen, the testimony of the very depths of my heart, because, you know, my fellow brothers and sisters, I didn't have the privilege of being raised in an Adventist home. I didn't have the privilege of summer school as a child to give me a really firm grounding um, for understanding and studying the Bible. I was never given the health message, and I never knew the Sabbath. I walked a life in the world, and as such, have experienced, witnessed, and endured many things that I can't even find the words today, today fit enough to describe the <coughs> ugliness, the depravity, and the horror of the traps of sin that lie waiting. When I sat down to prepare this particular message, um, I pleaded with God actually to inspire me to write something about Bible prophecy or you know God's promises or the story of salvation, really beautiful messages from the Bible, but the desire to share my testimony actually burned harder and harder and no other inspiration came. So I prayed all the more earnestly and then um, during my devotional time in recent weeks, I've been studying the New Testament and I'm still a novice, novice, really, when it comes to the area of diligent Bible study. Um, so discovering even the smallest, simplest things to me is really, really exciting. So I wanted to share with you today what I discovered. So we're going through the New Testament, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, chapter after chapter, step after step of Christ's birth, journey, ministry, his miracles, his parables, his crucifixion. And then I read on in Acts. Romans, Corinthians, first and second, Galatians, and you know, really the whole time one story really, really stuck with me. So I'd like us to take our Bibles and turn to the scripture reading for today, which is Acts chapter 9, verses 3 to 9. While you're turning there, you know, this is why God is so great, because when I read his inspired word, it tells me of another unworthy man, someone I can relate to, you know, who lived a life so far removed from the worthiness of Christ, the righteousness, the sanctity of God, 
who toiled with his wretchedness and reminded himself daily of the sinful life that he had had before and how he died and was reborn in Christ every single day. Up until his dying day. Let's find out about this man. So Acts chapter 9, verses 3 to 9. So I'm going to read again in your hearing. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go and go into the city, and it should be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. So this is a testimony of a man called Saul. So it's a supernatural event, witnessed by others, and that it changed Saul's life forever. He was on the road to Damascus, and we'll find out later why, but I'll just let you know that for now, he was on that road for the wrong reason. He wasn't necessarily going in the wrong direction, but the purpose <coughs> was far from what God wanted for him. However, despite that, Jesus still met him where he was, and he appealed to Saul's heart. You know, I believe that Jesus is waiting to have an intimate experience, personal one-to-one -one experience with all of his people. And I sometimes wonder what Saul may have done if he hadn't followed Christ's instruction. What if he had had this encounter, encounter with God, you know, a very real, tangible experience with him, so real in fact that he actually lost his sight? What if he'd had this experience and decided, do you know what, actually, I'm going to harden my heart and I'm going to continue on my original agenda? Or if he decided to maybe, you know, mm, I'll give it a go, go a little way to get my sight back, and then when it got too tough, when it became too much for him to bear, he decided to veer off to his old, wise, old ways. Saul, as many of you know, later on became the Apostle Paul. And 14 of the 27 books in the New Testament have been attributed to Paul. So that's over half of the New Testament wouldn't even have had Saul not become Paul. So this in itself is a testimony to the power of an experience with Christ. Before we can truly understand the strength of Saul's testimony, testimony we need to learn a little bit more about him. So um, I said to you earlier, keep, uh, keep your Bibles out. We're going to be a lot in Acts um, today. So let's look at Acts 7, uh, verse 58. So Acts 7, verse 58. And that will tell us a bit more about who Saul is. So I'm going to read in your hearing. And cast him out of the city and stoned him. They're talking about the Apostle Stephen here. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. So we find out Saul's a young man. He is compliant in the mob mentality of stoning an apostle who was preaching and speaking out to the Jews about the message of Christ. So let's read on in Acts chapter 8, verse 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Skip down to verse 3. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing or dragging men and women and committed them to prison. If we turn over to Acts chapter 9, verse 1, it says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, and this is why we find out why he was on the road to Damascus, and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, being those that are preaching, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Sounds like a real gentleman, doesn't it? Yeah? Father's the kind of guy you like your daughters to bring home? Yeah? You know, to have the conviction to be able to hurt men and women alike takes some really fierce hate and violence, doesn't it? You know, men like this today, what are they called? Terrorists. Extremists. People who tell you to live their way and by their rules or suffer the consequences of their wrath and judgment. Look at the political unrest around the world at the moment, ISIS. You know, I'm sure they've got a couple of zealous souls in their ranks who believe every word of their doctrine and enforce it in their local society, crushing religious liberty. 
So great was Saul's reputation, news spread of him far and wide. Let's read on in Acts 9 and we'll find out um, how far and fast. But you know, let's bear in mind that this is before the days of social media, so there's no Facebook, there's no Twitter, there's no internet, no telephone, no newspapers even. So for news to spread, it was by the word of mouth. So a, a lot of people were talking about Saul and what he was up to. So Acts 9 verse 13. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And there and here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. Saul, you know, a hateful man who thinks that he's doing God's work. And I have no doubt that he was God-fearing. And but you know, as we learn later on in his writings, he was a very well-educated Jew. But despite this, he rose up against the good news message of Jesus Christ. Ellen G. White tells us in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 1057, for those that are interested, paragraph 4. Um, Saul had an abundance of energy and zeal to work out an erroneous faith in persecuting the saints of God, confining them in prisons and putting them to death. Although his hand did not do the work of murder, he had a voice in the decisions and zealously sustained them. He prepared the way and gave up believers of the gospel into hands that took their lives. In reference to his zeal, Paul himself says, I was exceedingly mad against them. I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. So the gospel spreading like wildfire. The Gentiles thirsty for the message. And Saul is infuriated, along with the other Jews, annoyed beyond belief that these Gentiles are claiming salvation for themselves and the Messiah as their own. We read, we read in Acts 9 and um, 1 that Saul was breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. Have you ever been so angry, so mad, you start muttering to yourself? Does that ever happen to you? It happens to me all the time. And you know, women, you might be able to relate to me here, but when it happens to me, I start cleaning. Yeah? Start cleaning till I can't clean no more. And then by then I'll have worked it out. Saul so angry at the progression of the gospel and the success of the apostles that in Jerusalem, however many miles they were away from Samaria, where Philip had been evangelizing, he hears what's happened. Do you know what? He decides to take action. Extremist activity, isn't it? As Bible prophecy believers, we are watching the signs and know soon that our religious liberty will be removed. And the homes that we know will be forced, and will be forced, I'm sorry, will be removed from the city and the homes that we know, and we will be forced to make a choice. In his time, Saul was the enforcer. He was the enforcer against people who were taking away their religious, religious liberty. So we've built up a good idea of who Saul is, haven't we? Does it sound like a nice guy? Kind of guy you want to have lunch? So, he's hateful. He's zealous in his work to stop the early church and the spreading of the gospel. Non-discriminatory in enforcing violent strategies for men and women. You know, how do my sins compare to this? How do your sins compare to this? And yet, God decided to use Saul for a great work an accomplice to murder, an instigator of hate crimes, a persecutor of Christians. Jeremiah 1.5 tells us that before God formed us in the belly of our mothers, what did he do? He knew us. And he already had a purpose for us to fulfill. That comforts me. You know, it tells me that no matter how polluted my life was before, God can and will use me if I'm willing. Many of you may, may know that I was a Sikh that converted to Adventism, but even as a practicing Sikh, I was not clean. I wasn't free from sin. I'd had a child out of wedlock. I was working in quite salacious environments, I suppose you could call them, you know, nightclubs and bars. You know, there was one time where I was working as a bartender and my uniform was hot pants and a vest in any weather. And at the time, you know, I didn't think anything was wrong with it. I thought, you know, this is the world that we're living in. It promotes women to be very sexualized and sell products. Look at the next billboard that you drive past or the next magazine that you read or the newspaper on the bus. There's lots of scantily clad women selling, you know, even the most innocent of items, perfume, shampoo, face cream. And, you know, nowadays the media are using men to do the very same thing. 
That's not what God wants for us. There are some parts of your body that are only meant to be seen and appreciated by your spouse. If you ask anyone who knew me in my late teens and early 20s, their description of me would be, you know, quite distasteful to hear now. I'm not afraid to admit it, because you know what? God saved me. So I am not ashamed to admit to you how I was before. I had a foul mouth. You know, profanity upon obscenity at every opportunity. I was outspoken, yeah, I still am now, but at least I don't get myself into fights anymore over the things that I say. I used to drink, I used to smoke, I used to actively participate in the nightclub scene. All things that when I think of them now, you know, fill me with horror. You know, they make me feel sick when I recall some of the situations I found myself in and the general unpleasantness of just being around strangers, intoxicated, not in control of your senses and your faculties. But thousands of people are living like this life today, week after week. They're at the pub, they're doing whatever they're doing, weekend comes, that's all they're looking forward to. But you know what, my life was empty. I had a void to fill, and that was my way of doing it. I didn't know that there was another way. If people only knew that there is a way to maintain your dignity, integrity, and clothing, and you can enjoy a life filled with peace and happiness that does not come from relying on alcohol or you know, any other validating external factor. It just takes faith and belief. You know, I wonder what Saul was thinking in those three long days at his temporary residence on an aptly named Straight Street. You know, if this had been me, I would have started to doubt what I'd seen. You know, have you ever been there where you had that kind of experience where something so in inexplicable happens and it felt so real at the time, but on reflection you just think, nah, that couldn't have happened. That couldn't have been what I saw. It couldn't have been what I experienced. And you know, you convince yourself that it just didn't, it didn't happen that way. How many blessings of God do we miss out on when we reason with the understandings of mankind? You know, Saul is waiting, waiting for what he doesn't know. A few years ago, um, Otis was playing football, and he ruptured his Achilles heel. He drove home, I don't know how he drove home, I don't he even knows how he drove home, but he drove home, not realising the damage that he'd done, and decided to go to the hospital just to get it checked out. <laughs> I'm so blasé about it. He didn't even realise how severe the injury was, and he was admitted from that night, and he didn't walk again for another good couple of months. He'd gone that evening to A&E expecting a minor injury, and I'm sure Saul had been on the road to Damascus expecting to just go about his usual business. And then he lost his sight. When Otis came home from the hospital a week later, he was incapacitated. And I, at that time, I just had the two children, Sienna and O'Shea. And O'Shea was just a small baby at the time. Um, so I was managing the care of Otis and the management of the household. I was working, I had the kids. But you know, life for Otis particularly must have been really hard. You have the liberty to walk one minute, you can do everything for yourself. But the next you rely on someone half your size, physically, who carry you, lift you, change you, dress you, bathe you. What a humbling experience it is having to have someone care for you and attend to your every need. The three days that Saul waited, he, he was so humbled and, you know, filled with remorse. His physical blindness led to a spiritual awakening where he had a chance to see his actions for what they had really been. A persistent persecution of Christ's people. You know, the thing that struck me about this story is that up until this point in the New Testament, we only read about Jesus blessing the people, so healing them, performing miracles. And this is the first instance where he denies someone something and incapacitates them in such a way. An arresting action that causes Saul to dwell on his circumstance. What must he have been thinking? Oh, I wish I hadn't sent, you know, Timothy and Bartholomew to go and get murdered or bound up. Oh, I wish I'd stopped the stoning of Stephen as the blood was pouring from his head. Can you imagine what he was thinking? Mm. You know, he was fasting and praying for repentance, for cleansing, for an opportunity to answer God's call. You know, if I was to draw a line that represented a timeline of change, and at one end is the soul that we're reading about now, and the other is the Apostle Paul that we love and revere, how long would that line be? How long would your line be? How long is my line? Good, a good few feet. A good few feet, I can tell you. 
How much work had to be done for Saul to become Paul? How much conviction did he need to turn aside his life of old and accept the mantle of responsibility and the humility of Christ to preach the message? The Lord appears to Ananias and sends him to Saul who is waiting. Ananias goes, restores Paul's, Saul's sight, sorry. What's the first thing he does? He gets baptised. What a way to acknowledge his spiritual change and the error of his ways. He obtains physical sight and then realises his first action is to, even before breaking his fast, is to be baptised and born again. He wants to declare through a physical act that his heart and spirit have changed. Then his attention turns to his next work. In um, verse 19 of Acts 9, it reads, And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And then verse 20, it says, What's that word that it says there? Has anyone got their Bible to hand? And what, sorry? A straight way. Not a week after, not two days after, and straight way, he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Now, this word straight away here is used in other places in the Bible to describe things that happen instantaneously. So Matthew 8 verse 3, it says, And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleaned. Cleansed, sorry. Mark 5 29, And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she'd been healed of that plague. You know, when we read these stories, we feel that sense of urgency, don't we? The sense of speed it happened like that. The consequential actions carried out straight away, no delay. How was Saul received in conducting his new work? Were people just as excited as he was? How effective had his spiritual change been in starting the new ministry? It tells us in verse 21 of Acts 9. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem and came hither for the intent that he might bring them bound to the chief priests? Verse 23. And after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to what? Kill him. Verse 26. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, that they were all afraid of him, and believed not that he was a disciple. There was a heart-crushing, soul-destroying disbelief around Saul's intentions. The grief and disappointment that he must have felt, knowing that although Christ had brought about an instant change in him, the development of his new character had not yet been witnessed by others. When I returned to work after my maternity sleep with O'Shea, which was when the bulk of my reforming of character began, my work colleagues could not relate to who I now was. So I was when I was on mater- well, before I went on maternity leave, I was that sucky, and then I fell pregnant. I stopped smoking, stopped drinking, but I was still kind of that sucky. And then went on maternity leave, had an encounter with Christ, and then went back to work. One of my colleagues asked me, "Bring that old sucky back. We miss her." The old sucky was so much more fun. My other colleague said, you're still the same, just a bit nicer. I laugh about it now, but you know, at the time, it was hard, it was painful for me to understand why they just couldn't let go of all these things and these previous memories and just accept me in my new reformed character. God had to chisel away a lot of my old self to reveal the person that he wanted to use. When I started going into work, winning charity initiatives and bringing in my adjective, I just couldn't believe that I was this person who cared about someone else, somewhere else in the world, so much so that I'd bring in a tin and raise money for them. I just couldn't believe it. And you know, even now, I still say I'm a work in progress. I'm nowhere near the finished article. The Bible even says to us, you know, can an Ethiopian change his skin? Or the leopard change his spots? You know, the people were unable to accept that Saul had changed for the better. The rapid change from Saul the persecutor to Saul the preacher was just too much for them to bear. Oh. In verse 1 of Acts 9, he's reading out threatenings, but by verse 20, he's convicted, baptised, preaching the word. You know, I bet some students at university who wish their degree went that quick. You know? Look how mighty God is. He's not messing about. When he wants to get the work done and he knows that he needs to change you, he doesn't wait around. No matter how far you have walked away from him, no matter what sins plague your past and present, be convicted today that Jesus wants to use you. All you have to do is just be willing. Submit and listen to him. 
As Samuel answered to the Lord, speak for thy servant hearing. And as I, Isaiah said, here am I, send me. So the Lord is waiting, waiting for willing people to answer his call. And you know, God doesn't just wait for you to answer and then to send you away. Off you go. He fills you with the Holy Ghost. He gives you the most powerful tool of all, the testimony. Share it with others. So many people are waiting to hear just a small nugget of the golden gospel that will come forth and shine in your testimony that you share. The first person that believed Saul was Barnabas. What a glorious moment for Saul that must have been. In Acts 12, it's the last time that the Apostle Paul is referred to as Saul. So that's when his change has fully taken place. From Acts 13, we read about the journeys of Paul and where he travels preaching the gospel. In Acts 20, he makes a decision to return to Jerusalem, the first time since he testified to Barnabas and was accepted by the disciples. And all the people he meets and the brethren that he's with plead for him not to go as they fear that he'll suffer greatly at the hands of the Jews in the same way that they were uh, pleading for Jesus not to return to Jerusalem. However, unshaken by these concerns, Paul goes. He faces the toughest crowd ever so far in his ministry. It is at this point that we hear him speak of his own testimony and his experience with Christ. That's when he tells people, I was on the road to Damascus. I was struck down and I met Jesus by the way. And I was blind for three days. That's the first time he says those words to people. In Acts 22, despite being captured, he asks for the opportunity to speak. He's then cast in prison as the people don't want to, they don't want to hear what he's got to say. But as soon as they learn that he's a Roman, he's granted a, an elite audience. So in Acts 26, he's permitted to speak before the king Agrippa. What's the king's response? Acts 26, verse 28. This really touched me when I read it. It said, then Agrippa, this is a king. Agrippa said unto Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Even the story you just told me, but you wrote to Damascus and made me, a king, want to give up this and take on the mantle of Christ. There's no doubt in my mind that Paul's testimony opened up opportunities for him that would not have been granted to him otherwise. George, um, George, Jesus is asking us to testify of what he has done for us so that others may be blessed, encouraged, and come to realise the love of Christ for themselves. What is your testimony? What has God done for you? He took me out of the gutter of sin, cleaned me up and blessed me with an amazing husband, a loving family, you know, I took a career break from the job that I mentioned to you earlier, um, because at the time, just my spirit was just so disheartened. You know, God was boring down on my conscience and telling me that that particular work, which is, is, wasn't what he wanted me to do, just was not what he would have for me. And he knew that aspects of my job were causing me to compromise my faith, my commitment to him and to my family. So after a lot of um, procrastination and deliberation and tears, I left. You know, I've worked since I was 14 years old, been in employment non-stop, every day after school when I was 14 I'd go and sweep and mop a restaurant. <coughs> so I'd never ever had a period of unemployment since then and the only periods I'd had of not going to a job every single day was when I was on maternity leave with the children. So I, when I had given my notice, I worked out my 30 days, I didn't have another job to go to, I didn't know what I was doing. I just said to Otis, I can't work there anymore, I need some time, I need to be at home with the kids. So I woke up the first day, I didn't have a job to go to, and I was like, what's going on? <laughs> the feeling that I had, I was scared, I was worried that I'd feel sad, but you know what, I was filled with so much joy, so much joy. I felt like I was ready for God to bless me, and I just couldn't have been more excited. I took a 12 month career break, and in that 12 months, I qualified as a nutritional therapist. And that allowed me to open the door to a health ministry. So last week, some of you may have noticed, some of you always mentioned that I wasn't here, and that's because I was at Breath of Life, uh, and I was preaching and serving with them on their health emphasis day. So I ran some health workshops with them, um, and was there to minister to them, and it was a real blessing. The qualifications allowed me to kind of have the privilege of working with a wide array of people. So I've worked with dementia patients, um, applying nutritional knowledge in a practical way to help them manage their illnesses. 
I've run free community clinics in um, concentrated areas of obesity, diabetes, hypertension, a whole plague of things that are, people are affected by locally. Um, we've run free community clinics, had funding to do, do that. We've run educational workshops. I've ministered to even some of my colleagues that I work with now and shared just a little nugget, a nugget of advice to help them manage things like arthritis, skin conditions, or you know, a whole host of ailments. Um, I was asked to be part of the Mission to the City's Health Board, and I sat on the board and ran programmes for diabetes reversal, managing addiction, so many things that I've been involved in, and never would have had the privilege of doing these had I not taken this break and allowed God to use me and speak to me to do something. You know, this isn't probably a very um, impressive list or extensive compared to other people's, you know, missionary accomplishments, but I've been able to make contact with people who I never would have been able to previously. I've had the opportunity to share the health message and impact people in a way that encourages them to learn more about God. Isn't this part of our purpose and role as Christians anyway? You know, um, at my old church, I served as a treasurer for a couple of years. And while I was serving there, I went to a treasurer's retreat in Greece. Um, we went there and all the treasurers around the whole of the UK, so North England and South England Conference were there. And the hotel that we were staying at was beautiful, um, and it was all, in cute, all inclusive, so breakfast, lunch, and dinner were provided. And to this day, I've never seen Seventh-day Adventists chomp down on so much meat in all my days. Honestly, chicken for breakfast, chicken for lunch, chicken for dinner, chicken for pudding. It's like they couldn't get enough of it because it was free, it was all inclusive. I was one of maybe three or four vegetarians out of a group of over a hundred, and I wasn't even born Adventist. Some of these people are long time standing Adventists in the church. Their names have gone down from generation to generation. Sons of pastors, some, you know, people that should know better than I do. And I remember there was one young man from the South, he said to me, so why don't you eat meat? And I was like, well, my Bible, what about your Bible? My Bible tells me that eating flesh will shorten my days. And I want to be as healthy as I can. And he replied, oh, I just thought it was an Indian thing. And I was like, no, it's not an Indian thing. It's a biblical thing. So, you know, we were at this retreat for, was it five days? Oh, two, so five days a week, I think, yeah. Um, and every day, as the, as the retreat progressed on, and we had these meals together, three meals a day, he always would look at my plates of food, see what I was eating. He'd look at my plate, and he'd look at his plate, and he'd look at all the plates of other people on the table. And everyone else's plate, piled high, chicken, fish, all this other jazz, and I'm like, salad, like nothing else, but this did cater for vegetarians very well. Salad, maybe a couple of eggs. Um, and uh, he came to, by the end of the week, he just came to me and was like, do you know what, I've been Adventist all my life. He was from Barbados, he was born into an Adventist family. And he was like, I've never seen someone so passionate about the health message and uphold it as much as I have until I've met you. He went back to his hometown and sent me a WhatsApp message a few weeks later saying that he'd gone and told his wife about me and they were now reviewing the health message together and they decided that they were going to cut me from my diet. Now, that wasn't my doing, that was the Holy Spirit impressing him, speaking to his heart as I testified to him about what God had done for me. And I've got a thousand other stories like that that I can tell you where, by nothing miraculous that I've done, I've said something, shared something, told someone something, and that has inspired them. God has inspired them to do some further research, learn a bit more, open the Bible, read a story, pray. A very simple thing, even just to pray. You know, all I ever do is reveal the source of my principles, and it leads the way for the Holy Spirit to work on that person. That's all I can do. I'm not the worker of miracles, but I know someone who is. I'm going to leave you with a reading from um, Ellen G. White, and it's taken from the same SDA Bible commentary that I mentioned earlier. So this is entitled Divine and Human Cooperation Necessary. So always the Lord gives the human agent his work. Here is the divine and the human cooperation. There is man working in obedience to divine light given, and it is the very hardest, sternest conflict which comes from the purpose and hour of great resolve and decision of the human to incline the will and way to God's will and God's way. Do you hear what Sister White is saying here? 
It's going to be the toughest of times. It's going to be the hardest of times. The worst times when God gives you an opportunity to testify of his greatness. And it's up to you to make the decision to do so. <coughs> How will you stand? And to whom will you testify when called upon? Look at yourself. Search your heart. Are you ready to present yourself to the Lord and say, Here am I. Take me, Lord. Use me, Lord. Surrender yourselves. However filthy and plagued your life is with sin, knowing that Jesus' ever-abiding love will cleanse you and make you fit for purpose. Bend your will and allow God to enter your heart and make you a willing servant to testify of his goodness in your life. Thank you. Amen.